in living theory and actual research. He is also former president of British Educational Association. He is also, last but not least, professor of professor of education at University of, of Cambria. Thank you very much. Welcome. I was hoping that I could see your faces, and it's absolutely blinding. But it's a real pleasure to be here at the University of Bolton. Um, it's my first visit here, and it's such a pleasure to come to talk about something which has been right at the heart of my own professional life, which is about the generation and the story of the development of what is known as living educational theory research. And what I'm focusing on, just to start with, is something that 50 years ago today, um, I was driving back from my science teaching in Tower Hamlets in the East End of London, and I was on my way to uh, the University of London uh, for my philosophy course, because I was studying philosophy and psychology of education with a couple of professors and their team, uh, called Richard Peters, Paul Hurst, and others that actually introduced me to philosophy of education. And they believed that educational theory was made up of philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history of education. Okay, that was educational theory. And I believed that. And it was like this when you talk about thinking differently. There was no way that I was thinking differently. That what had happened is that I'd come into my teaching with my science degree, I believed fervently in the importance of scientific forms of understanding. I then started studying. After one year of teaching, I went into continuing professional development at the most prestigious uh, institute of education in the country to really try and develop my professional knowledge. Now, it took me some time before I began to challenge the very notion of educational theory that I was receiving. And it was only in 1971-72 that I began to see that the way the philosophers and psychologists and sociologists and historians were talking about educational theory was mistaken. Now, you couldn't really tell those eminent people that they were making a fundamental mistake. You know, as a teacher coming from the classroom to say, well, actually, you, your, your whole theorization is mistaken. But it was mistaken, and it was only in 1983 that Paul Hurst acknowledged the mistake that they made. There was me going from my teaching, and I taught for four or five years by now, just trying to understand how to improve the science education with my pupils. I would be getting the philosophy, psychology, sociology, and the history of education, and whilst I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot, there was no way that any of those disciplines individually or in any combination, could produce a valid explanation of my educational influence in the learning of myself or my students. Now, I hope I'm making sense there, because in 1983, Hurst acknowledged he'd made a mistake, that they said that the mistake in this disciplines approach was that they viewed my practical principles that I use to understand my practice as pragmatic principles that had a first crude and superficial justification in practice that would be replaced in any rationally developed theory by principles from the disciplines of education. So it wasn't a case that I could generate my own explanation in terms of my educational influence on myself or my pupils. It was that I had to go back into the disciplines of education and actually justify what I was doing through those theories. Now, I imagine that you are like me, that most of you have gone through, say, university to get degrees. You've probably had to regurgitate through the assessment procedure the knowledge that has actually been transmitted to you that you've then transmitted back through the examination papers. Now, that's what I did up to my master's degree. I got my master's degree in the that was in the psychology of education. So I moved from the philosophy in academic diploma over to the psychology. My psychology tutors persuaded me to carry out a controlled experimental design 
in terms of the science department. By that time, I was the head of the science department. Randomly allocate my pupils, there were 81 pupils, three groups, work out a controlled experimental design to work out the treatment group, uh, which focused on inquiry learning. Now, it took me all that time to recognize that that was an inappropriate approach to try to explain my educational influence in the development of the learning of my pupils and myself. Because that wasn't a causal influence, which the implication of carrying out that kind of, it was a physical science methodology, where there would be a determinate relationship between the variables. Whilst what I was doing with my pupils was actually part of an intentional relationship. No matter what I do today, I can't have a causal influence in how you learn and what you think. It's your creativity and imagination which will have to engage with what I say, which ultimately influences your learning. Now, I hope that point's clear, because what I did uh, in 1973, having decided that the key theorists in education in this country had made a mistake, I moved from a passion for science education to actually becoming a university researcher at the University of Bath to see if I could then reconstruct what counted as educational theory. And the idea that I developed was that you and I, in our practice, where we're asking questions of the kind, how do I improve what I'm doing? And in my case, it was in my professional practice as an educator. So that was the key question. How do I improve what I'm doing? That I had the capacity to generate a valid explanation of my educational influence in my own learning and the learning of my students. And I referred to that kind of explanation as a living educational theory. Because what was wrong with the traditional approach to theory, because I think most of you will have gone through this, where you actually, through a process of deduction, go through the general principles and conceptual frameworks of a theory, and you deduce an explanation for an individual case. That's how normal theory can be generated from conceptual abstractions to a particular case. When I tried to explain my educational development, it simply did not work. I had to generate my own explanation rather than deduce it from traditional theory. So I hope you can see how different that idea of generating a living educational theory was from traditional theory. Now at the same time that this was going on, the inspector in Barking, when I was the head of science, provided me with one of the first video cameras to be given to schools and asked me if I would explore its potential for the science department. So the first thing I did was turn it on myself. That first lesson that I videoed, I got a tremendous shock. You know, it was a little shock because I thought I'd got inquiry learning going in my classroom. I genuinely thought that the pupils were asking their own questions and that I was actually responding to them. The videotape clearly showed, however subtly, that I was giving the students the questions which I would then respond to. It was always being hypocritical. It was a genuine belief that I got inquiry learning going in the classroom. Now, that was the moment where I experienced myself as a living contradiction. So the I in the question, how do I improve what I'm doing? And I guarantee that almost everybody in this room who is passionate about some values that you hold will have at times experienced yourself as a living contradiction because you're not actually living as fully as you could the values that you actually subscribe to. So that was me as a living contradiction. Now, I don't know how I, uh, many of you have... <coughs> I know Aristotle um, is well known in terms of his theory of knowledge. But Aristotle, in his work on interpretation, actually ruled out contradictions in correct thought. He had a particular work on interpretation, which basically says you can't have two mutually exclusive statements that are true simultaneously. And this is part of the Aristotelian logic that dominates Western universities. I would almost guarantee that a reflection on yourself as a living contradiction where, if you're like me, I held together the experience of valuing inquiry learning or, at certain times, academic freedom and justice, but at the same time, 
I was actually negating those values in my practice. Now that led me to a very different kind of educational knowledge. Because the traditional knowledge that you will, I think, have been receiving most of the time at the University of Bolton, and not just here, but in other universities, actually holds theory to be constituted rather like Aristotle said. You eliminate contradictions from correct thought. And here was me saying, well, actually, as I build an explanation of my educational influence in my learning and the learning of my students, and I then went on to look at the social formations that influence my practice, I am a living contradiction. And I insist on placing that living contradiction in my explanation of my educational influence. Now, I don't know if you can imagine what a shock this is to university research committees that, for example, get a research proposal which first start has got I in the title. How do I improve what I'm doing? The first time these kind of inquiries are put forward at uh, various universities, the research committees ask for the personal pronoun to be removed. Now, I don't know if you can understand how literally silly that sounds to somebody like myself who says, look, my question is how do I improve my practice? And the research committee is coming back Remove the personal pronoun. Well, what sense do you make of the question where the I has been removed? Those were the first kind of statements we got from the research committees. Now, we pointed out gradually over time that it was legitimate to put the I in the inquiry and that we could generate valid explanations of our education in this over time. Now, I spent most of my professional life at Bath actually demonstrating that people like ourselves could get their doctorates from creating their own living theories. And the last 16 years of my time at the University of Bath, um, there were 32 doctoral successful doctoral completions, which at the time was the highest number of any member of staff over that period of time. They're all on the web, and you can see that they differ in terms of whether they're from the police service, from higher education, primary school, health, there's some lovely work there from the health service where um, nurses are asking, how do I improve the quality of my care? So what I wanted to demonstrate was it was possible to get the knowledge that everybody in this room in my understand has as embodied knowledge in what you are doing and you reflected on and developed over several years and that we can find a way to make this public and develop it over time so that it can gain the highest level of academic qualification because of your knowledge creating capacities. Now that has been demonstrated. The only thing I'd like you to remember is the URL actionresearch.net because if you go into actionresearch.net you will be able to access freely all these doctoral theses, the masters, that we've got a whole journal which is going for 10 years now called the Educational Journal of Living Theories. All of these are freely accessible, internationally refereed in terms of the quality of the living theories that are now publicly available. But more than that, the actual living theories have been what we call relatable, not generalizable in the sense that you apply one theory to an individual case because they are generated by individuals. But you'll see over 40 successfully completed doctorates now from South Africa, from Nepal, working on teacher education in Pakistan. The most recent one has gone through from Canada, Nipissing University, where the person has been really courageous in putting being loved into learning as one of her values. Now, although love can easily be mentioned in relation to education, I do feel that I love what I do. To have it as an academic standard of judgment and get it legitimated in a university was quite unusual. But we've now actually begun to get love in terms of the individual's meaning as a passion that someone has for what they're doing as an academic standard of judgment. And you can access those from that actionresearch.net. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you in relation to thinking differently is that behind me is the University of Bolton, TEDx. And at the moment, what I'm doing here is being on a live feed 
into YouTube. And the other 11 presenters today will have all been on that live feed. You can access those videos immediately. You go home, they're there. Now what I'd like to suggest is that we in this room have got an amazing amount and quality and depth of embodied knowledge that you could now make public, as I've been suggesting in your own living educational theory, which is an explanation, as I say, of your educational influence in your own life. You could now, and we must find a way, I think, to do this, respond to some of those YouTubes that you've actually heard the presentations today and actually engage with them in a way that enables your embodied knowledge and who you are and what you're doing and what you believe and value to bring them into a public space with those conversations and those communications made public. Now that would actually transform the nature of the communications that we will have, for example, the 18 minutes that I will have been on with that YouTube clip. But actually, that is rather insignificant in comparison with everybody in this room becoming determined to make your knowledge shareable with others here and also then through the internet with the encouragement of others. But nevertheless, you say, look, if I ask the question, how do I improve what I'm doing? You know, where are you doing that? What's your context? What values do you hold? Can you share those with us? Because that then extends the community of living theory researchers enormously. If you look at everybody in this room with that capacity to explain your own educational influence. Now, I want to just add before I finish, which is look at the explanatory principles that each one of you will be using to explain your influence. I'm claiming each one of you has got a unique, a unique constellation of values that you use to give meaning and purpose to your lives. Now that is what you could engage us with. You could show that maybe it's in terms of love or freedom. Compassion has come in a lot. Caring has come in a lot of the doctrines. A passion for this notion of the academic freedom. Justice is another one. That the notion of social justice, also gender justice. Somebody's just put in a doctorate at Cambria University, which has got gender justice right at the heart of the living theory. But each one of you will have something that is moving you, and it's a real passion. Now, those are the values that you can use to explain your educational influence, and you could share those with each one of us. I hope I've made sense there, because I'd like to leave you with that thought, that to think differently, I'm saying that you could generate your own living educational theory Share that in conversations and communications based on and around these TED Talks that you've heard today. And in that way, I do believe, we'll be contributing to a social movement which helps with the flourishing of humanity. So thank you. Thank you.